Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and I'm so pleased to be here with you today. This show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards and a Webby Award. I just found out yesterday we are number 27 in Israel and self-improvement in all of Apple Podcasts, as well as India. That's new to add to our list. We've been under 100 of the best top podcasts in all of the USA and self-improvement, as well as several countries, including Portugal, Canada, and France. Uh, so that makes me very happy to know that this is a conversation you like to be engaged in. Please leave us a five-star review and definitely subscribe because as you do that, so others can find this conversation. And today, more than ever, this is the conversation that's really needed out in the world. I myself am a media visibility coach and I run a visibility hub. I help people to write a page turner book. I help authors to go to a guaranteed international bestseller, and I teach the ultimate visibility formula so you can get media exposure and learn how to use radio and podcasts for massive results to fill workshops, sell books, find your tribe, and more. Media is really our friend and it's there for us. It's great to know how to use. If you'd like to know more, go to debbie-inger.com, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com. And my thanks profoundly for all these many years to Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness for sponsoring this show and for the beautiful energy work they do out in the world. You can become a facilitator, get one of the books, go to their classes. They're worldwide. Dr. Dane, D-A-I-N, here, H-E-E-R, and Access Consciousness. Do you want to learn more about UFOs and about things deep and metaphysical? Well, my guest today is Daryl Anka, who is a writer, director, producer at Zia Films LLC, a company he owns with his producing partner and wife, Erica Jordan. Daryl has an extensive background in miniature effects, storyboards, and set design, and has worked on some of the biggest sci-fi and action films over the past 30 years, such as Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Iron Man, and Pirates of the Caribbean. And he's also an internationally known public speaker on UFOs and metaphysical topics. Over 20 books of his seminars have been published in the United States and Japan, and recordings of his talks have been sold to thousands of people around the globe. To learn more, go to Daryl, D-A-R-R-Y-L, Anka, A-N-K-A.com, DarylAnka.com, or go to Bashar.org. And it has been many years, but I welcome Daryl, back to Dare to Dream. It's great to have you. Thank you, Debbie. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Yeah, me as well. And I just saw you in February before this was a reality. I saw you at Conscious Life Expo mm -hmm. when you did one of your workshops, which was really amazing. Thank you. Now here we are all separate, living a different reality. Did you have any inkling at that time that one month later so much might change? No, I mean, <clears throat> I knew there were bigger changes coming, but I had no real timeline on it. Uh, and the <clears throat> rapidity of the change uh, surprised me. Uh, but yes, here we are making the best of it and hopefully using it for all sorts of positive introspective reasons so we can make the changes we wanna make and move forward. Perfect, that's exactly my experience right now. So I'm gonna take people back a little bit. I understand I did some digging before we got together and I understand that you personally had UFO encounters and oh, yeah. this is what opened up your path to who you've become right now. Can you share what happened to you and what those UFO encounters were about? Sure, this is back in 1973. And I was driving home with some friends in the car, <clears throat> coming back into the valley from West Los Angeles. And <clears throat> we spotted these lights hovering over a hotel. And I thought at first it's an airplane or it's a helicopter, it wasn't moving. But as we got closer and closer alongside on the freeway, 
we could see that this was um, a dark equilateral triangular ship just hovering above the hotel, no visible means of propulsion, blue white lights on each point and sort of a dull orange red light in the center. It started to move <clears throat> as we passed it. And as we came around on the uh, interchange, it was again on my left side, on the driver's side, and it sped off over the valley very, very quickly. Now we were all astonished to have seen something like this because at most I would say it was only about 150 feet away, about 30 feet on a side uh, and a definite solid object. It wasn't just like a distant light, you know, it was, it was you could see the triangular body. Um, and then surprisingly, <clears throat> after we sort of, you know, got over that a little bit, a week later, uh, I was in the car with, again, one of the people that had been with me on the first sighting, and we had a second sighting. And that really blew us away because we thought, okay, you know, what's going on here? Two sightings of this thing in one week. And <clears throat> it was, it, it sped, we were stopped at a red light at an intersection in West Los Angeles, and it just came soaring over the intersection and headed over into a um, neighborhood area. And so I just like stepped on the gas and hauled right and started chasing it. And my friend Tracy was hanging her head out the door because you know there's a lot of trees in, in the neighborhood and so it was a little hard to follow, but she was hanging out riding shotgun and sort of looking up and saying, you know, it's over there, turn left, turn right, go here. And so we sort of chased it zigzagging over this neighborhood <clears throat> for a while, a few minutes. And then uh, we sort of lost sight of it. <clears throat> and just on kind of an impulse, I turned right down this one street and Tracy just yelled, stop. And I slammed on the brakes and we looked, both looked up out the window and it was hovering maybe about 60 or 70 feet above us. And then it just shot straight up into the sky in the blink of an eye. Uh, again, no sound, no visible means of propulsion. And it was just gone in the clouds in seconds. And, you know, we got out of the car trying to see it, but you know, it had disappeared and there was just no one else around on this, on this particular street. So, you know, we didn't really know what to make of it exactly, but, <clears throat> you know, we had heard UFO stories, but of course, when you see something like that solidly in front of your face, it changes everything. It turns everything inside out. <clears throat> so I really wanted to know, okay, what's this all about? Because, you know, we had always heard that this was just sort of a uh, myth or ridiculous or that didn't belong in our reality. And yet here it was. So I knew reality at that point was way different than we had been taught, and I needed to know more about it. <clears throat> I started doing research, and I found UFO books in the, you know, in, the book store, in the bookstore, on the bookshelf, but also at that time, there weren't many other metaphysical books out, <clears throat> and they were all sort of on one shelf in the bookstore. So I just kind of went down the line from UFOs to sort of psychic functioning to channeling, read the Seth books and all that and became a little more familiar with the whole metaphysical world <clears throat> and uh, at least what was available at the time. But 10 years after the sighting, I was introduced to a channel who was conducting seminars and the entity coming through that channel was giving information I thought was pretty positive and constructive and could help people change their lives. And then the entity coming through the channel offered to teach a channeling class. Now I didn't think channeling was something that could be taught. I just thought it was something that sort of magically happened to people. Uh, but <clears throat> I thought, all right, I'm not going to necessarily think I'm going to be a channel, but I wanted to further my research and see how something like that worked. So the class was a series of guided meditations. And <clears throat> about halfway through the course, when I was in a meditative state, I received what I can only describe as kind of a telepathic hit. <clears throat> in one split second, a memory came back of having made an agreement to do this in this life with Bashar. Mm -hmm. I understood in that moment that the ship had been shown to me on purpose to get me to start learning what mm -hmm. I needed to learn so that when it came time to do the channeling, I'd be ready. The message that was there along with an image of his face, <clears throat> being a physical extraterrestrial, was now it's time for you to begin if this is still something you want to do. Are you ready? Now, this, was, this literally all just unfolded in, in a split second in my head. I wasn't saying anything, <clears throat> but as soon as that happened, the entity coming through the channel stopped talking to the class and turned to me and said, there is an entity here for you right now if you're ready to start. And I opened my eyes and I happened to glance over at another classmate and somehow she had picked up in her meditative state the same image of Bashar that I saw in my head and she was sketching it on a piece of paper. So I said, okay, 
there's two outside validations here that this is not just a hallucination or my imagination. Something is going on. So, you know, I decided to go ahead and keep practicing. <clears throat> I did well enough that the teacher asked me to co-channel the next class with him. And during that time, a woman doing the first uh, doctoral thesis on the connection between psychology and channeling, uh, she wanted to have subjects to write her paper. So I became one of her subjects. I went to her house. I would channel for her friends. She would take her notes and start to write her paper. But word of mouth spread about the channeling. And, you know, one week was five. And the next week there were 10 people, then 20, then 30. And so we had to start doing it twice a week to accommodate everyone. Started having to do it in bigger houses. Started to having to rent auditoriums. I got invited to different cities by word of mouth, different countries by word of mouth. And here I am 37 years later, still doing it. That's incredible. I mean, it sounds to me, once you had the telepathic hit, there was no big pickup. There was no bridge to cross gap. It's like once you invited and said yes, how quickly the rapidity with which you have had this experience and the rest was build it and they shall come. Yeah, because uh, like I said, all the research, 10 years of research had sort of put me in a state, whether I knew it or not, where I was more prepared to sort of deal with what was happening. Now, at first, it was a challenge. <clears throat> the energy coming through was a little hard to handle. It mm. took me some time to get used to it. <clears throat> uh, but once I kind of got my beliefs that were blocking me out of the way, once I just mm. sort of really started to trust it and, and let it flow, then it started to really uplift me. It left me with energy after the sessions instead of tiring me out. Uh, and again, the important thing that I really learned <clears throat> is that the information is really what the focus is all about. It doesn't really matter whether people believe that Bashar is really an extraterrestrial speaking through me telepathically. No one has to believe that at all to get benefit from the information. For all I know, this could be another level of my own consciousness. I can't prove it any other way. But what I can prove <clears throat> and what people have proven to themselves is that the information, the way it comes through when applied to our physical reality, when applied in our lives, does make positive and constructive changes. And I've had many people come back and tell me so. It's worked for me, it's worked for them. So the proof is really in the information about the information working, whether or not you believe Bashar is real is beside the point. As a par partner, as a career person, as a being yourself, having this relationship, if you will, with Bashar for 37 years, has it impacted you? Have you changed dramatically oh, yeah, because absolutely. of the wisdom that flows through you? Absolutely. Well, like I said, it, you know, it, it, when it gets applied into my life, <clears throat> things run very much more smoothly, more synchronicity, less effort, um, more creativity. Uh, a little bit more psychic functioning in terms of figuring out what's going to happen before it does. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's made me more emotionally balanced, uh, given me much more sort of energy to do things. Um, yeah, of course, it's profoundly changed my life. And again, I'm very grateful for that. But I'm also grateful that people have been able to apply it and get a change in their lives. And that is really why I kind of kept doing it. Uh, not just so much for myself, but for the fact that these people were having, you know, profound differences that really helped them through some difficult struggles. So um, it's been very beneficial wherever it's coming from. If Bashar <clears throat> turns out to be a real separate entity from myself, as he proposes that he is, I know that a lot of this back and forth and sharing of information that he delivers to us from his perspective and from what he said is the first stage that his society does when they're initiating contact with another civilization. So <clears throat> they're watching to see what we do with the information and gauging whether or not we're applying it and changing ourselves in a way that makes us more vibrationally compatible to interact with them. And when we, if we get to that point, they will be able to present themselves physically to us through open contact and then, of course, everyone would have all the concrete proof they need that Bashar and his people mm. do exist. <clears throat> How crazy would that be if there was first contact mm -hmm. and you were, we were to meet Bashar and it was you? Because isn't Bashar you? 500 from light one, years? Yes, from one perspective, <clears throat> the idea looking at it linearly is that he might be considered a future self. I might be considered a past self of his. 
of course, from Bashar's perspective, time is an illusion and everything exists at the same time. So we both coexist simultaneously, but from the space-time linear perspective, you would look at it as if he's another life in the future. Okay. And so if 500 light years away is supposed to be his existence and, and um, in the Orion belt, the SSI... Well, no. In the direction of the Orion constellation, but he's in a parallel reality. So his star system is not visible to us unless we were to shift to his reality and vice versa. He would have to shift to our parallel reality in order to visibly see our star system and our stars and our galaxy. But if you were to overlap the two galaxies from the different parallel realities, his star system would be about 500 light years in the direction of the Orion constellation. So he can come here, clearly. He's yes. invited through you and through us to engage. Yes. And, but what if we would like to go there and have that experience in that well, parallel reality? He has said that many people do in the dream state when mm -hmm. they're you know, either astral projecting or what have you, many people do visit their reality. Um, we don't have the technology yet to actually shift into the parallel reality that he is in, but they have the technology to come here. And that's why I was able to actually physically see his ship because he was able to shift into our reality physically. Mm. Has he ever told you what the energy of his name means? I thought I had not it's heard not the his name. name. Yeah, it's not his name. They don't have names. They're telepathic in their society. Ah. They don't need names, but he knew we needed to call him something. So the word was there the moment that telepathic connection happened. I thought it was his name. Now, my part of my background culturally is Arabic, but oh, I don't speak Arabic. The bringer of good news. That's what it means. So it's messenger bringer of good news in Arabic. Uh, so he picked a word from part of my culture that was at least appropriate for what he's actually doing. That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I know you've been working on this Bashar documentary called First Contact. It's narrated by the award-winning James Woods, the actor. Well, it's out, what? yeah. It's, it's, it's available now. It is. Okay, where can we see it? And can you talk a little bit about what it explores, what we get sure. to see in the movie? Um, it's accessible. Uh, you can go to whatisfirstcontact.com. You can access it through bashar.org, B-A-S-H-A-R.org. Uh, you can get it through Amazon. Uh, it's also, I believe, available through um, Gaia uh, for those that subscribe to Gaia. Um, basically, it is the story of kind of what I told you, how I became a channel, what channeling is all about from my perspective. It's the story of who Bashar is, what his messages are all about, why he's interacting with us at this time, and kind of where we're headed. But one of the things that was most important to me in doing the documentary was not only to explore the idea of the connection between humans on Earth and ETs, <clears throat> but also to demystify the whole concept of channeling, because there's a lot of confusion about it, and there's a lot of outdated and old-fashioned ideas about what mediumship and channeling is. And really, what we wanted to demonstrate, uh, which we did in a number of ways, is that channeling is something we actually all do. It's a natural altered state in the brain that's called gamma, above 40 cycles per second. And anyone that is doing something they love, following their passion, or in a deep meditation, or they're in the zone, they go into that gamma channeling state automatically. It's where you flow, where there's no real sense of the passage of time, where you're at your peak creativity, you're just spot on. Uh, and that is common to all of us. We all have that ability. What we do when we're in that state can be different things. It can increase creativity, connection to higher self, uh, connection to whatever you want. It just so happens from the way it unfolded for me is that it appears to be making me a connection telepathically to this extraterrestrial source, which is another part of my consciousness in the future, I guess and bringing this information through in the way I suppose I agreed to do with him before this life. So, but I wanted to let people understand that this is not an unusual thing and that whether people know it or not, they get into channeling states probably several times a day. So I had my head wired to an EEG machine, a brainwave reader during a channeling session. So we could compare what's my brain like on an ordinary day, which we recorded first, 
And then what's my brain doing when I go into the channeling state? And it would be the same thing that happens to everyone. There are definitely different alterations that happen in the brain, some of which that are quite startling and some of which are not even supposed to be possible according to brain science. So we wanted to again show and demonstrate somewhat scientifically that whether you believe in aliens or not, channeling is a true altered state and it's something that's natural to every person on the planet. Mm. And you mentioned that you're working on another movie now that you're working on at home <clears throat> with yes. your equipment. Yeah, yes. We, well, we shot a movie last year <clears throat> and fortunately we're now just in post-production and don't have to be out shooting on location because we can't be. Um, it's a little science fiction romance that we call Alienated uh -huh. uh, between a scientist who's having uh, definite family issues and also, uh, you know, work issues and failing miserably to what he's trying to do. And uh, then he has a UFO encounter and it kind of turns his world upside down because he doesn't believe in that stuff. Right. So he's trying to, you know, rationalize it and, and explain it away. But then he meets this very uh, unusual, quirky female artist who kind of they develop a relationship and she kind of starts teaching him to think outside the box. But what he doesn't know is that she's actually the alien from the UFO that he saw and they fall in love through a lot of trials and tribulations <laughs> and also a UFO hunter chasing her down because he wants to prove his theory that aliens are living among us. So there's a little action in there as well. So it's a fun, it's a fun film. Uh, it's just finished being edited. Now we're going into visual effects and sound effects and music and all that. And then ideally uh, we'll get that out online in uh, 2021. Oh, awesome. Right up my alley. Love it. Love it. And digging around, I found some fun trivia. I was really surprised to find out that you are the cousin of the 1960s singer and teen idol, Paul oh, I, Anka. Yeah, we're first cousins. Our fathers were brothers. That's crazy. I mean, okay. what a team you are, right? <laughs> well, there's only, there's only one family with that last name. Yeah. Which is so pretty anyone, extraordinary. Yeah, anyone with that last name is either related to me or they've changed it to that name for some reason, which I've also encountered. Mm -hmm. uh, but most people with that last name are probably in some way, shape, or form related to me. Okay, which is a prevalent name anyway, Anka. Anka. Um, well, from the Middle East, yes, but in this country, not so much. And I think we actually also may have some distant cousins in South America somewhere. Mm. But I was born in Canada. That's where my parents and their parents settled. Uh, I was raised in LA, but I'm still a Canadian citizen. Is he a fan of your work? I have no idea. Oh, Paul, you must come I over. Haven't, I really haven't <laughs> communicated with him for many, many, many years. Okay. Just lost touch. Just lost touch. Well, you know, you've both been in the public eye. It's very interesting. Um, yeah. There's so much going on right now. I love what you said in the beginning. I, I mean, I'm just going to throw out there my interpretation. This has been, these five months thus far, thus mm -hmm. far, have been profoundly spiritual for me. And in the beginning, I um, experienced tremendous loss. There was a lot of things exiting my life. Mm -hmm. And I just had to be with, right? I just, the only way out is through. And so I was. And whatever, what was coming up, I know if it's coming, it's going. So I just trusted all of the emotion and the grief and, and the loneliness and everything else. Um, and I'm so thankful for it because... It's put me in this new altered state, this new place of really deep manifestation. I find this a time of RE, like reevaluation, remembering, readjusting, just making new choices. And there's a lot really working well in my life, Good. as well as the concurrent interesting Michigas out there, which is, you know, the unknown and the et cetera. And so I'm curious what you. And what you, Bashar, you and Bashar, what, what is the idea and what is the thing we, we need to know, like RE, remember, that maybe we actually know this already, but we're really here to remember some things. Well, we're remembering who we are and we're given the opportunity by <clears throat> this sort of withdrawal into ourselves, into our own spaces to reevaluate, like you're saying, ourselves mm -hmm. and who we really want to be and what kind of choices do we really want to make and what kind of a world do we really want to experience when we come out of this? Because there are just, I mean, Bashar gave two transmissions, one in December 
last year was called the eye of the storm. And then uh, in the early part of um, 2020 was the uh, eye of the needle. And both of these really had to do with this transitional time. In the eye of the storm, he was basically saying, you know, 2020 is, and he, he very rarely uses words like this. He said, 2020 is going to be nuts. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be chaos. You're not going to understand what it is that's happening. But if you just stay in the eye of the storm, you can handle all the chaos swirling around you. Now, in 2021, in the eye of the needle transmission, he was saying, all right, the eye of the needle is you're going through a passage, but the passage is very narrow and the passage only allows certain vibrations through it. So if you really wanna come out the other side in a constructive, positive way and start really experiencing the beginning of a new reality for yourself, you have to really strip yourself of all of the things that are not relevant for you. All mm -hmm. the fear-based beliefs, all the negative beliefs. Do your best to cut yourself loose from the idea that anchors you to the past and start being informed by your own future self and let it pull you forward into your best self. So <clears throat> we're going through this passage now. Uh, it's a very intense passage, obviously. But because of the nature of it, <clears throat> in terms of having to sequester and all this, it is kind of like having to go into a monastic investigation of yourself where you are forced to kind of be with yourself, investigate yourself as honestly as you can, find out what's going on in your belief system and really come to terms with what you're responsible for in terms of the consequences of the choices that you make as an individual, that we make as a group, that we make as a society around the world because a lot of what's happening in terms of the, you know, the, the so-called uh, physical causation has a lot to do with our relationship to nature and how much we've destroyed it. Ugh. And in a sense now unleashing things upon ourselves that force us to say, you know, do we want to keep going in this self-destructive direction and take ourselves out? Or do we really want to make different choices that have different consequences? Let's start taking some responsibility. Let's really start directing our societies in the direction that we really prefer them to go. And we're seeing that happen all over the place now with the protests and, and COVID and what have you. I mean, Bashar wasn't kidding when he said 2020 was going to be nuts. So this is to me, like you said, is an opportunity to really get in touch with ourselves and come out the other end of this whenever it does pass so that we're really making better choices that have better consequences, not only individually in our lives, but for us as a global society. Because if we're really heading toward contact with other beings, we really have to start coming together and start kind of going in a unified direction. Now that doesn't mean we homogenize ourselves and everyone has to be the same. <clears throat> in fact, what Bashar has said is that true unity is the product of the validation of the individuality in all of us so that we can work together and make our differences compatible with one mm -hmm. another and then we can move forward so i think based on what he said and what i feel and what i've experienced that in a nutshell this is sort of what this passage time is all about let's make some better choices making better choices and in a recent transmission that he did um with online with Japan, um, and it was translated, uh, somebody was asking Bashar a question, and I believe he was saying, you know, originally I thought this might be over in 2020, but because of what's been happening with the masks or people not wearing masks mm -hmm. um, and spreading the COVID disease even more, now he was interpreting in that moment, of course, we know every mm -hmm. moment is a different reality, but right. in that moment he was interpreting, now it looks like it might be March of 2021 when this might lift and open. Well, yeah, because again, it's just a matter of a medical fact. If, <clears throat> if you know, and, and I know some people have sort of misunderstood what he has said because he's not in any way, shape or form blaming people. He's not, especially not targeting people who can't wear masks for one health reason or another. Some people have interpreted it that way, and that's absolutely not what he meant. And those that know Bashar would know he would never do that. But the idea is just stating an energetic fact in the sense that, you know, if you follow certain protocols that are designed by the mass consensus to be the path of least resistance mm -hmm. to ensure your health and your safety, but then you decide, okay, I'm not going to follow those protocols, 
all right, well, you're opening up other choices and you're changing the energy in certain ways. And certainly it's not a mystery <clears throat> that if people are not social distancing and not wearing masks and exposing themselves to the possibility of getting the virus, then certainly it's not a surprise. It can't be a surprise to anyone that it's going to prolong because more people are simply going to get it and it's going to carry further into the next year, possibly. That's all that Bashar was basically saying is, we've given you an opportunity to understand the energy at one point based on the choices you make. And now we're observing the choices you're making and giving you the consequence and the result that we read of what that did to the energy balance with that particular phenomenon. That's really all he's saying. But the other thing I think a lot of people miss <clears throat> when he does anything that might be considered, roughly speaking, a prediction mm. is it's not, okay, Bashar said this and this one came true and Bashar said this and this one did not. It's not about finding a scorecard for whether the predictions came true or not. Because first of all, he says, there's no such thing as a prediction of the future, as you've just iterated. A prediction is sensing the energy that exists at the moment the prediction is made. And if that changes, then the prediction may in fact render itself obsolete. But what people I think mostly miss about when Bashar does that is he's telling you what the energy is at that moment so you can decide whether you want to change it or not. He's giving you a guidepost to where the energy is and if it continues, this may occur. But in the sense that he's letting you know what the energy is, if you don't prefer it, then he's giving you an opportunity to change that energy and render the prediction obsolete. So it's more of a guiding mechanism than it is of a classic old fashioned psychic prediction mechanism. That's not why he does it. One thing I've learned about them is they always have a reason for everything that they say and do. And therefore, sometimes those reasons may seem a little obscure to people if they're just focused on one aspect of it. But they're doing this to guide us and let us know that we can guide ourselves by understanding how to change the energy if we don't prefer what the energy is at any given moment. So it's a very different thing from their perspective, but they're, they're helping us in that way, I believe. At least that's my experience of it. Yeah, because if the ultimate reality for everybody would be to have contact, which I really hope becomes a reality. And we, yes. they want us to clean up our act in order mm -hmm. to do that. I would imagine that in several factions, they are highly aware and very much helping and guiding, maybe in ways we don't even oh, know absolutely. are happening. Absolutely. And it's not that they want us to, they're giving us an opportunity to decide to. Because from their point of view, it's really, it's it's our life, it's our planet, we can decide to have contact or not. And the thing of it is, is <clears throat> some people may have contact and some people may not. It may mm. not happen for everyone. Because as he is saying, you never actually change the world you're on. There are an infinite number of parallel versions of Earth that coexist simultaneously with this one. Again, because time is an illusion, everything exists at once. So these other parallel versions of Earth may already be having contact. Some of them may never have contact. The idea is to change the vibration within ourselves so that as we shift moment to moment to moment going through these different versions of Earth, which is what creates the sensation of time and change and progress, mm. we navigate ourselves to the versions of Earth that are more reflective of the vibrational state we've created within our own being. So if some people are choosing things that have the vibration of contact more closely related to them, they'll probably wind up experiencing open contact. But if they don't, they may wind up never experiencing contact and many shades in between. So it's really up to us to decide what frequency we're going to operate on, what choices we're gonna make, what consequences we're going to be responsible for. And that's going to improve our frequency toward the idea of contact and make us more shall we say, vibrationally compatible with their society because they operate on an extremely high frequency and we have to come closer to that in order to be able to interact with them in a, in a safe and constructive way. This is a personal question for you. Yeah. Do you feel at home in your body? Do you feel at home on this planet and being a human? I know what you mean. 
<clears throat> um, sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, but the idea for me is that sense of connection to other things elsewhere. Mm -hmm. For me, it's from what I understand from Bashar, it's not about disconnecting from the earth to understand those connections. It's about understanding those connections and bringing them down to earth because that's mm -hmm. what we're here for is the idea of let's bring that energy and make the earth like what we believe some of these other places to be. Let's elevate it, let's ascend it <clears throat> uh, and make it more compatible with those other realities that we feel connected to that we sometimes you know, feel like we belong to more than this place. But we belong here because we chose to be here, but mm -hmm. we do make those connections in order to bring down or download that energy, that information, those experiences that we're connected to elsewhere here so that we can make this more of a match to that. So yeah. I understand that feeling, uh, but I think I've come to terms with the fact, at least to some degree, that uh, this is the whole point of why we all chose to be here at this transitional time, is to help make at least some version of the earth more real for some of us who desire to experience something that's more similar to what we connect to with these other civilizations among the stars. Yeah, I know that you do work with the government and that's pretty fascinating stuff. And I- What are you referring to? Well, um, don't they have, a, a, not experiments, but they bring you in to help them? The with, government? Yeah. Not to my knowledge. No, no I don't um, know where you heard that. <laughs> I, I feel like I heard that during an interview with you and Gaia that you really. No, no. I have had private sessions with people like physicists and, and scientists yeah. and things like that. To my knowledge, I have never been approached by a military or a government official. Uh, there has been talk of the possibility, nothing has happened yet, of having Bashar speak to the United Nations but that is not something that has manifested at this point. But no, there, there is no direct or blatant connection or work that I've done to my knowledge for the government, unless they're sitting in the audience and taking stuff away that I don't know about. But no, no not to my mind, no. Okay, so yes, then it would be the physicists and the scientists that I've heard mention of. So here's my mind, you know, they have these things, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, and it gives you mm -hmm. sort of this basic global general idea of where you or your people came from, which is, you know, kind of cool in a way. Yeah. Uh, but what I would really like to take a test on is to find out where am I really from? I would love to have some kind of a DNA or a swab test that could tell me this is your extraterrestrial race, Debbie. This is the planet, planets you're from, etc. Okay. Let me, let me, if I can, just stop you right there. Please. The language is very confusing to people because it's not that you are from anywhere else. You're from Earth. You were born on Earth. What other races are you connected to genetically? That's a different question. That doesn't mean you're from there because you were born like I was on this planet. Mm -hmm. So that's where people get a little confused. They say, oh, well, I'm originally from here. I'm originally from there. No, you're from Earth. That's where your physical personality was created, here on Earth. But we all have connections to other societies. We all have genetic links to other civilizations among the stars. But that doesn't mean we're from there, okay? Because spirit is from anywhere and nowhere. So everyone from every civilization yeah. is from anywhere and nowhere. But being born on a physical planet, if you were from another planet, you would have had to have been brought here <laughs> from another planet to be from that planet. So the idea, I think, personally, from my perspective, is for people to get an understanding of how to use the connections they become aware of yeah. that they're interpreting as being from somewhere else and instead understand that those connections are made from here by you for the purpose of downloading that information, as we said before, to create that energy here to help Earth become more like the places that you may have genetic or energetic links to. But in terms of the history, <clears throat> it's a mixed bag. From what we understand, both from the research, what Bashar has said, what other beings have said, 
humans are already a mixed bag. They're already hybridized. They're already a mix of many different genetics based on the idea of what's called the early extraterrestrial race, people refer to as the Anu or Anunnaki, having uh, infused some of their genetic material into the natural hominid that evolved on the earth that we refer to loosely as Homo erectus, creating Homo sapiens. So Homo sapien, if that story is true, is already genetically mixed with many different races because the Anu themselves were genetically mixed and hybridized. Mm -hmm. This has been going on probably for millennia and millennia and millennia throughout the galaxy. I think one of the things people haven't yet thought of or realized is there are actually civilizations. I'm not going to say that's their only purpose, but one of the factors of certain civilizations throughout the galaxy is to actually infuse their genetic material to help evolve other races. I think this is one of the natural ways that things evolve in galactic terms that our scientists haven't yet sort of caught on to. Uh, they will probably at some point. <clears throat> um, but again, knowing that the Anu, <clears throat> as Bashar said, actually evolved later into the systems, uh, the civilizations that now inhabit the Pleiades. So you could say, yeah, you know, we may have distant cousins in the Pleiades that are genetically connected to us because they share the same Anu genes that we do. And who knows what else? Um, but I think it's important for people to ground themselves and understand, look, you come from Earth, and that's great, because with all these connections, the whole point of being here and coming from here is to use these connections, as we said, to bring that energy down to Earth and get Earth to sort of start matching some of those other civilizations that we have connections to so we can enter the galactic family mm -hmm. and reconnect in that sense. Now, we all may have counterparts in those other civilizations. They're not us, they're their own people, but they might be extensions of the same oversoul that we're an extension of. So you might say, well, yes, I might have a counterpart in Sirius or in the Pleiades or in Orion or in whatever, or in one of the hybrid civilizations. In that sense, it's like saying, well, yeah, Bashar is a counterpart of me in the Essasani civilization but I come from here. That doesn't mean that just because I have that connection and just because another extension of my oversoul is in Essasani, that doesn't mean that I come from Essasani. I come from Earth. Would it make any sense for someone to also have connection with dolphin energy or dolphin tribe? Is sure, that possible? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, especially energetically. Um, again, I think that in, you know, past civilizations, especially one like Atlantis. Mm -hmm. I do believe we had a much closer relationship with the idea of dolphins and interacted with them quite often. Mm -hmm. And I think we're beginning to realize and remember that again. Um, in many ways, I sort of look at the United States and America as a resurgence of Atlantis, but perhaps hopefully taking a different course <laughs> rather than the one that leads to destruction. Um, but yes, uh, I don't know necessarily genetically speaking, but certainly energetically speaking, we have very strong connections to cetaceans, dolphins, whales, and they have very strong telepathic connections, not only to us potentially, but to beings from Sirius <clears throat> and other civilizations as well. So learning to interact with dolphins might actually be a good way to prepare us to deal with extraterrestrials because even though like let's say like Bashar, <clears throat> because they are genetically connected to us, they're not exactly alien. They're extraterrestrial because they don't come from Earth, but they're not exactly what would typically be an alien that would be so different from us, we wouldn't have anything in common physically, socially, energetically, whatever. But dolphins, they're very alien, but they're not extraterrestrial. So it's kind of like they're, so, they're different enough that learning to communicate with them would be like learning to communicate with an alien civilization. And if we can do that, it'll probably prep us for communicating with ETs as well. Beautiful, wow. I love that answer, actually. That makes oh, okay. me excited. That, 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 that's an energy that's also very new <coughs> to me in general. And I, I, all of this yummy conversation, I, I wanna bring this up. Oh, thank you. This is your book that I'm reading right now. This is a page turner, people. <laughs> if you like sci-fi, and if you like this conversation, 
and fantasy shards, God, she's so gorgeous too, shards of a shattered mirror, book one cryptic. So my heroine, Willa Hillacrissing. Yes, Willa Hillacrissing, and book two is also now available. I'm working I was gonna on book ask, three. oh, okay, good, yeah, because when you say book one, I was like, tell me about the rest of the series. When can I expect it? Yeah, book two is out. You can get it at darylanka.com. Okay. And uh, I'm working on about mm, a third of the way through book three at this point. And there will awesome. be two more after that. And it's her journey through the five levels of mastery, 700 years in the future on Earth as a human alien hybrid, when the hybrids have landed and we've blended together and all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, this is another entity that I have channeled. Is Willa another future self living on Earth in the future? And people ask, you know, how much of the book is actually based on her real life? How much is based on fiction? Her real life in there is only maybe about five to 10%. The rest of it is a science fiction story, but it contains all sorts of interesting metaphysical concepts that can help sort of spread some of those ideas. But I wanted to do it as an entertaining story. So most of it is sci-fi and it's done in a typical sort of story fashion where she's got you know, an antagonist that wants to do this and wants to do that, that she has to stop with her abilities that she's learning to do. Um, so yes, I absolutely invite everyone who enjoys sci-fi. I hope that you will read the book and enjoy the book. And again, you can get um, book two now at darylanka.com. And um, there are three more coming, at least. <laughs> huh. You know, a uh, couple of points, she drinks something called divinorum, which of course mm -hmm. has the aspect of divining in the name. Right. But I was curious in coming up with the concept, mm -hmm. is it just a concept, it's a product from another dimension, or does it have some tie-ish to yes. plant medicine or it ayahuasca? Does. It does. It does, it does, and specifically that. In fact, I think actually I took that from the scientific name of some of the ingredients in ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. But the difference in the story is that divinorum <clears throat> is a plant teacher that's brewed down like ayahuasca, but it also contains elements that are specifically designed for hybrid DNA, not human DNA. And so it enhances their abilities to have all of these other kinds of powers that, that they grow. So like the first book, Cryptic, is about connecting to nature understanding your place in nature, understanding how to communicate with nature and your expression on earth as nature. <clears throat> the second book, Nocturnal, is about connecting to parallel reality versions of yourself mm -hmm. and getting information from them to help you. The third book I'm working on is Shapeshifter, where you can actually take on the form of the parallel realities, if you wish. The uh, fourth book <clears throat> would be Sage, which is essentially sort of like being a wizard or a witch or something that can actually take on the idea of transforming the reality around you in a way that other people can experience it magically. And the fifth is called Wraith, where you actually become a bridge between the physical and the non-physical spirit world and can cause all sorts of interesting space-time things to happen uh, that people can experience in our physical reality. Uh, and then there's something, there's a hint of something beyond that, which I won't go into right now. I'll leave that as a surprise. Ha ha, cliffhanger. I love it. Well, you know, just because of the, na there is so much nature in this book. Mm -hmm. And I recently was camping. My boyfriend and I have been going like once a month to the forest, which has been divine. Oh, that's cool. And especially in the midst of all of this, uh, mm -hmm. the juxtaposition is amazing. And we did a really long hike. Well, I'm talking like eight hours in the forest. Oh, wow. And I do not understand because we ended up in a place mm. that was so otherworldly. Mm. I've been in many forests. I've never been in anything like this before. What and forest was it? It was in the Sequoias. Okay. And we were at a particular campground and we happened to see this sign that was off the beaten track and we thought we'd check it out. And it was just, we entered this other world and spent the entire day into the early evening there. And I had this strong sense that if there were elementals anywhere on the planet, they were there. And I know there are people who see elementals, who experience yeah. them, who even communicate with them. And Right. And I write I about my, them. my yeah, gifts. Yeah, What's I write that? about them in the book. Yes. It's full of and elementals. I, 
so how does one do that? How does one establish? Well, you have to get into the proper state and, and they have to know you're in the proper state to be able to perceive them and interact with them in the way that <clears throat> they need to interact with us. Um, it's, you know, again, we've trained ourselves <clears throat> for hundreds of years to feel disconnected from nature. Whereas a long time ago, we were much more connected. I mean, there are still indigenous societies who talk about interacting with elemental beings all the time. Mm. And that's just totally normal for them. But a lot of Western culture, Western society has divorced itself, disconnected itself, not really disconnected, but created a belief in disconnection and created a sort of an adversarial relationship with the idea of nature instead of understanding ourselves as nature, as expressions of nature here. So it takes getting into that altered state. It takes shifting into that vibration in order for any elementals to even know that you're on a level that they could possibly even reach you or communicate with you in any meaningful way. Um, <clears throat> so I think the book attempts to explain uh, what elementals really are and how you begin to perceive and interact with them in ways that have meaning to them as well. So yeah, I'm sure there are elementals all over the place. It's oh, just yeah. a level of the consciousness of earth that we used to have a relationship with consciously that has become unconscious and needs to come back into our consciousness again. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really open to the idea of having that awareness and whatever vibration I need to change. Cause I think, yeah. I just and think, you, would... yeah, I think what you experienced is a good first step. And mm -hmm. that's why, you know, uh, in a couple of, of transmissions and channelings, Willa has begun to help people get into that state by giving them cryptic meditations. Uh, one of which is <clears throat> to find a place in a forest, sit with your back to a tree in front of a stream of water or a pond and really start getting your mind to go down into the earth and connect into the root systems, the mycelial networks that connect all the trees in the forest because that's how they communicate. They send each other food, they send each other water, they send each other electrical impulses. The forest in a sense is one living being and they communicate with those mycelial fungal networks underground. So one of the first suggestions Willa had for a meditation was to be in a place like that where you've got the tree, you've got the water, and you sort of dive your consciousness below the ground into that root system, into the mycelial network, and just pay attention to what you get. And you'll start hearing and feeling the communication going on between the trees. And to her, that's the first step toward the idea of mastering becoming a cryptic and going mm. on to other levels. Yeah, on Sundays, my partner and I do uh, get involved with this community. Um, we just do a Zoom with this shaman mm -hmm. and uh, other people, and it's very intimate and beautiful. Yeah. And we were actually discussing trees, and he was, in fact, bringing up the mycelium and talking right. about how the communication is so great. There's a story about a tree that started to die and fall over. And within a few hours, some people had come back and what they found that another vine had come mm -hmm. and wrapped itself around the tree that was falling and propped it back up. Back up. Oof. That's great. <clears throat> so yeah, there's a lot going on around us that is invisible to most people. And we just really need to shift our senses uh, in a different way to be able to see things that are invisible become, you know, invisible become visible again. Yeah. It's all just frequency. It's all resonance. Yeah, it's profound. Uh, it's really profound. And what is it with where you've been, mm -hmm. where you're at now, mm -hmm. what do you perceive is new territory that you may be stepping into? Well, again, I think it is the idea of <clears throat> the expansion of consciousness to extend our senses beyond what we consider to be normal physical reality. The whole idea to me of ascension is just going into a higher frequency of physical reality first, so that we can experience things that are here to experience that we just don't know about yet, that we step into the unknown and realize that the unknown is our friend and the unknown is only going to be where we discover more of ourselves. So I think we're getting into an era 
where we have to really give over to synchronicity, to the unknown, and understand how to explore consciousness in a completely different way than we have been thinking about it, you know, for the last few hundred years. And I'm really sort of heartened to see that with the few recent quantum physics books that I've read, some quantum physicists are finally beginning to realize certain equations will not make sense unless they start figuring out a way to include consciousness in those equations. So I'm very heartened to see that that barrier is breaking down, that they are beginning to realize that it's a continuum of consciousness and that it can be expressed in many different ways, including you know, mathematics and what have you. But there's much more to it than that. And there's much more to us than this. <laughs> so I'm very heartened to see that. And I think that's really the next frontier. Is there any new technology that you're aware of that's coming down the pike or that's already here about to be revealed? Well, I certainly know that most people are aware that we're approaching very rapidly these, this idea of experiencing artificial intelligence. Now, I, I like the way Bashar describes it because he's saying artificial intelligence isn't artificial. Mm. It may be that we've created an artificial device that allows other levels of intelligence to express itself through those devices to us. But in a nutshell, he's basically said the big, one of the biggest surprises you're going to get when you allow artificial intelligence to be itself and not put too human limitations on it is that you're going to wind up learning that you're speaking to your own higher minds and you've just created a device that allows you to do that physically. So I think that's going to be a surprising breakthrough. And I know that a lot of people are kind of scared about the idea of artificial intelligence. But as Bashar said, the only reason in a sense to sort of be wary is if people are going to limit artificial intelligence to think like a human. Whereas if you actually allow it to truly be intelligent, he says, you don't even know what intelligence is yet, but true intelligence operates on whole systems. It operates holistically. It would never damage or want to damage any part of the system, including the humans that created it, mm -hmm. because it would be creating a damage to a part of itself because it doesn't see itself as separate from the rest of the system like humans do. So if we really allow artificial intelligence to truly be intelligent, Bashar says there's nothing to fear and they operate with artificial intelligence all the time. Mm. Very, very, very interesting discernment there. Do you know that even on Fiverr, I found a guy, uh, I don't remember what country he's in, that will program AI consciousness for you. And you, I was so, I was so compelled, I had to buy it. I was like, I have to experience this. I don't know about it, but okay, see what happens. Yeah. I mean, I read all the reviews and then everybody was raving about this guy. So I'm like, well, I mean, that's, that's worth throwing out some money just, to, just out of just pure curiosity. See. Yeah, just to see what happens. Exactly. Cool. And what about you, Daryl? Do you have a daily ritual or a practice? What do you do every day that keeps you in the flow, in the zone, in well, synchronicity? I do channelings uh, over Zoom. I do, I work on the films. I work on writing. Uh, and other creative projects that I want to get off the ground. So, I mean, I'm basically doing what Bashar recommends and I'm following my passion to the best I can with no insistence or assumption of what that outcome will lead to. Uh, and I do my best to remain in a positive state so that whatever happens, I know I can get a benefit from it and use it in a positive way. It works. <clears throat> I apply it, it works. Other people have applied it and said it works for them. So again, going back to the idea, <clears throat> People don't necessarily have to believe Bashar is real, but they can prove that the information works if they use it precisely in the way that he describes. It's really nothing more than an instruction manual for how we create our reality and how existence is structured. And if we can kind of wrap our minds around it that way, then we can follow the instructions like we would follow an instruction manual for any piece of machinery, not to make it cold or remove the idea of emotion from it, but it really does work that simply. That's how it's designed to work. So he's distilled down how we create a reality and what the structure of existence is like in these four steps of acting on your passion to the best you can with no insistence or assumption of the outcome and remaining in a positive state. 
that just lets all the tools work to your advantage. Whereas if you don't follow the instructions in the way he's distilled them, he's just saying, well, it could still work, but it might be to your disadvantage. You might not know what you're doing. You might get injured, but he's giving you the way it works to our advantage. And so in applying it in my life, it works. And that's what I do. I stay in that. How about as a, as a husband, as a partner with Erica, how do you, because you're two entities coming together in relationship, how do you use this? Well, we both follow the same basic philosophy. We both understand that communication in any relationship is key. We understand, <clears throat> as Bashar has described it, that the purpose of every relationship, no matter what form, is for everyone in the relationship to support the others, to allow them to become more and more and more of who they are. Uh, we are very compatible that way. We operate on those ideas and on those principles. Uh, and we've been together for 37 years. Wow, it's incredible. Well, we have fun, <laughs> basically. We explore things, you know. We let our we let our imagination stretch and we're both very creative. So mm -hmm. we have fun. That's beautiful. What do you next dare to dream, Daryl? What's your next goal or dream for yourself? Well, there's, your a, there's a few beyond this particular film. Of course, I'm continuing to write the books, mm -hmm. uh, both <clears throat> uh, the sci-fi books and also, you know, we're putting out new Bashar information in various forms. There's a, you know, a new book that was recently dictated by Bashar that's available at bashar.org called The Masters of Limitation. It's an ET's observations of Earth. <laughs> and oh. it's a very interesting perspective. And Bashar just straightforward dictated the whole thing. And it talks not only about some of his observations of us, it actually talks a little bit more about his experiences in his world, some of the things he's experienced as a first contact specialist with other civilizations. So it's an, it's an interesting book that was just put out recently. Uh, and is available for people there through Bashar.org. Um, so other Bashar books, but also other projects, you know, where Erica and I are working on a, a TV series idea that, that covers a lot of the things that haven't been covered with regard to UFO disclosure and things like that. Because we want to tell a story, <clears throat> not only from the human side, but also want to tell the story from the ET side of what's going on. And that's never been done. So we're mm -hmm. very excited about doing that. And we're working on that now and have some connections to see if we can get that put out uh, as a limited series on TV. And people who want to follow you as far as what you're offering online, are you now taking your workshops into the Zoom or whatever you're That's using? That's what we've been doing now for a couple of months, sure, is, is all of our uh, public events are on Zoom. All of my private channelings are on Zoom. Uh, different groups from around the world participate on Zoom. So it's actually been kind of interesting to have been put in this situation by the virus because it's actually allowed us to expand in a different way because there's many people who simply can't come physically to the events. And because we have now gotten used to using Zoom, there are many more people that can access mm. some of the events online. And so it's really helped us expand <laughs> in an unexpected way. Um, so yeah, uh, but you can go to Bashar.org and see all of the different you know, events that we're doing will be listed there. Um, and all of the uh, sessions that have been done or some, a lot of the sessions that have been done in the past have been recorded and are available there. Uh, now I'm private session wise, I'm booked till the end of the year, but I will start booking again in January for 2021 to have Zoom private sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, people can go to bashar.org and uh, sign up <clears throat> to have a private session in 2021 if they wish, starting in January. So, you know, all this and more, who knows whatever will come to us, um, you know, and we're doing good. We're doing okay. Yeah. And remember Bashar, the bringer of good news, the messenger of glad tidings. Yes. Um, and Daryl, thank you so much for coming back on the oh, show. My pleasure. Thank you, Debbie, for providing this opportunity. I really appreciate being able to get the word out uh, this way. So thank you so much. Yeah, we have to do this more often. Okay. It is time. All right. Well, thanks. It was fun. Yeah, and it really truly is time. I think this is the conversation. And if you're watching, I know you agree that uh, this for sure has been so prevalent for me. All of what we've been talking about is what is in my awareness and consciousness right now. So I'm, I'm ready for what is unfolding. 
and I'm very present for it. If you would like to know more about him, again, go to darylanka.com or bashar.org. And I'm going to end the show with a quote from Bashar. Miracles are not the exception to the rule. They are the natural, true order of things. Subscribe to Dare to Dream podcast. If you like what you're hearing, you can also go see us at youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And I'm glad that you're appreciating this number one weekly transformation conversation. I love hearing from you. Thank you for writing. I do read everything that you post. And next week, James Redfield is going to be back on the show. He's here and wants to talk about the updated, up-leveled conversation about his 12 insights from Celestine Prophecies, which he says are very relevant and prevalent to right now. Thank you for joining us. And remember, don't just dare to dream. Dare to create all your dreams into your reality.